how to peacefully disconnect yourself from your toxic and narcissistic family. I've been home for some time and I was not working. So it was very hard for me to disconnect from my family. I'm not at a point where I want to disown or completely go no contact with my family, which is usually what is advised when dealing with a very narcissistic family. And my oh my, I have a very narcissistic mother and sister. It is a very toxic, unhealthy situation. And it has been all my life. It's just that I've only realized it now in my late 20s. But in a couple of weeks, I will be moving to another place in hopes of getting work opportunities. I don't know how long that's going to last, but this is like the first time since I've realized how toxic my family is that I'm going to be away from them. The first time that I was away, I was in varsity and then I started working for a little while. I, at that time, I hadn't realized the damage that my family had done to me. I hadn't realized how toxic, how emotionally abusive and narcissistic they were. I just had a lot of anxiety, low self-esteem, doubting myself, just feeling like there's a void and emptiness inside me, which was mainly caused by my unloving, very emotionally unavailable family and so now that I'm about to leave there are a couple of things that I've learned throughout this year about dealing with very toxic and very narcissistic family members in my case being my mother and my sister and the first thing is definitely staying calm at all times and it's not easy but it, it gets better with practice and I think I've, I've gotten better with this like staying calm because one thing about toxic family members one thing about narcissists they will provoke so many emotions in you you know they will because that's what they they feed off they want a reaction bad or good and I remember the first time I, I started hearing this that a narcissist wants a reaction whether it's bad or, bad or, bad or good but they want a reaction I, I couldn't quite understand it but now I, I, I understand and I see it, you know, from experience living with my mother and my sister. I realize that, you know, sometimes they just want a reaction of you maybe, you know, being happy when they are happy. And when they're not in the mood, you also are not supposed. This is like one of their things, rapid mood swings, you know, being on and off, which leaves you kind of tiptoeing around them and you never show what, what mood you're going to get. And sometimes they will just say something that's going to hurt you in order to get a reaction. So, you know, the good reaction could be like, be happy when I'm happy, be happy with me. Or the bad reaction could be like, I want to I wanna poke at you, I want to hurt you, and I, I want to get you to be defensive or like in fight mode. So it, they want a reaction. And it's the most twisted, disturbing thing ever, but... Staying calm is definitely one of the ways to deal with that. At first, and I think all my life, I, I have always been very reactive. I've always been very emotional. And I used to defend this and be like, you can't say I shouldn't be emotional when you hurt me or something is making me emotional, you know. I wanted to feel my emotions and, and you know, just express them. But that wasn't necessarily the right way to go about it. Yes, expressing emotions is a good thing, but you need to be wise about it. And I was not wise about it. I was very reactive, very defensive, way too emotional to such a point that I don't think my point would get across. You know, like I feel like sometimes when you get emotional, People just look at you as if you are the crazy one. You know, like you don't seem sane. You don't seem rational. So sometimes you kind of have to compose yourself, you know. You you have to put yourself together in order to be able to articulate yourself without people thinking that, oh, you're just being emotional, you know, and dismissing your feelings. And obviously, 
these are the type of people who are narcissistic, toxic, you know, psychologically or emotionally abusive, who want to make you feel like you are being too emotional or they want to make you feel like you're overreacting. But this is, again, just a way to twist it and turn it back to you instead of them acknowledging how they've hurt you or whatever they've done. So the one way that I've been trying to cope, and it's only now towards the end of the year that I'm just, I'm staying calm. You know, I'm, I'm learning to stay calm because once I get reactive, I get defensive or I get in this fight mode and I try to defend myself and I try to, you know, to sort of like stand up for myself, which is a good thing, but it just depends on how you go about it. I become the villain. Instantly when I get defensive, I become the villain. You know, somebody says, like my sister could say something hurtful to me. And once I get defensive and super emotional, somehow she turns it on me and it's like, oh, you see, you are the problem. It's very twisted. It's it's a very mental situation. But one of the ways that I'm just, that I've been actually peacefully disconnecting from my family because the disconnect actually because in my case I was still living with my family I'm still living with my family I'm only gonna be moving in like two weeks or so and that's not even like a permanent solution you know because it, it might happen that I might come back home but the very important thing is that you first emotionally disconnect and then you can physically disconnect because I'm realizing that with the move that I'm about to make, I've already emotionally disconnected myself from my family. And by just practicing to stay calm, you know, and not be reactive and not allow them to get the reaction that they want to get out of me, that's like the emotional disconnect that I'm starting and have started. And I'm also careful as to what I say. And I think most often now I say less, you know, first I'm careful of what I say if I do have to say something. But in most cases, I choose to not even say anything because whatever I say, whatever I say will be used against me. Anything can be used against me. These people are very mental. And I say that in a very... I don't, I don't even know whether to say in a loving way, in a factual way. So I'm not saying it, this is not, I'm not dissing them. This is not a jab. This because narcissism is actually a mental illness. So these people are mental. This is how you have to perceive them. Not because you are disrespecting them, not because you are undermining them, but you're speaking factually. These people are mental and I think that's just how I'm choosing to handle my family that, hey, they have a mental illness that makes them to be toxic and abusive and narcissistic towards me. And I just have to keep that in mind. And I can't lie to myself and be like, oh, I don't want to call my family mental. The more you lie to yourself and try to pretend like they're fine or they love you or whatever, the longer it's going to take to heal and move on. And the more they're going to continue to abuse you because that's all they know how to do. So I'm very careful as to what I say. Example of how anything I say can and will be used against me. So I mentioned this in another episode that I had gone to a friend's place, um, stayed until nine and Me being on the guilty side, being on the wrong side of things, I stayed up until half past nine. This was at night. I told my mother I was going to come back at nine. But because I was having a good time and good conversation with good people, it ended up going on for a little bit later than I said I would come back. Obviously, when I came back, my mother was not happy about that. I tried to apologize, but she said, we'll talk in the morning. And then in the morning, I took the time to address her. I apologized. And then I tried to explain why. I told her that I'm a very indoors type of person. 
I'm not someone who goes out that much. I think this year I've made an effort of going out every now and again, but it's still here and there. It's not that much. So even with that night where I stayed out and I was at a friend's place, it was just, it's a rare occasion for me to do something like that, especially at night. But I was at someone's home. I was not partying. I was not doing some wild activity. I was safe, you know. Um, And so the following morning when I told her and tried to explain you know why I did, I did apologize because I was wrong. I live with my mother, even though I'm in my late twenties, I'm an adult. I respect the fact that I live in my mother's house and I respect her rules. And I don't want to try to be like, you know, I don't want to disrespect her. That's just it. So I did apologize because I was wrong to stay out late, later than the time I had said I would come back. And then I just kind of tried to explain to her why I stayed out till that late, which was half past nine. I said that I sometimes get bored because I'm not working. I stay home all the time. And so I was just having a good time, you know, and and I ended up not keeping track of time. And that was quickly used against me that this is how people... This is my mother now talking. She was saying, this is how people get get like in trouble or start doing wrong things because they are bored. They, they say their lives are bored. Listen to me. There is a tad bit of truth in what, they, in what she was saying. Okay. I do also, to a certain extent, believe that sometimes people get into wild activities or you know, mix themselves up with the wrong group of people because they they thought their lives were boring. But at the same time, I was at someone's home. We were just having dinner. We played like one board game. I think we're like the time when I, where I lost focus of time, we were having like a deep, meaningful conversation about like how to live as a Christian. I was not out partying and being wild. And so what she was saying about the fact that, you know, like if you have that mentality of that your life is boring, you are going to get into wrong things. It didn't really apply to me because that wasn't my case. What I was saying about me being bored is valid because I don't work and I'm home most of the time doing nothing. And the one time that I actually just go and be with friends and we end up having a deep, meaningful conversation. She takes it as to mean that, you know, now I'm changing or I'm going to get into wild things or I'm going to like mix with the wrong group of people. It's also just it, it's also just undermining my judgment, which is something that I've really noticed with my mother and sister whenever they try to like, quote unquote, advise me. It just seems like you are undermining my judgment because I can also tell and judge for myself the kind of people that I'm hanging out with. But anyway, my point is to say I am very careful of what I say and I try to not say much at all if it's possible because whatever I say, whatever I say, no matter how logic or reasonable or rational it is, it will be used against me. It will be twisted and then thrown back at my face. So I'm very careful of what I say. I'm very careful of how I phrase things. This is just so unfortunate that you you have to be so strategic when dealing with these people. But having a narcissistic mother and a narcissistic sister has really taught me how to phrase what I say because I have to be very careful of what I say. In as much as I'm trying to be very direct and speak up for myself when I have to speak up for myself because that's something that I have to do with these people. Otherwise, I will continue to be taken advantage of. But at the same time, I still have to be careful because it will definitely be used against me. I'm also trying and I've been trying to be neutral. I I don't show my happiness anymore to my family. I don't show when I'm sad. 
I don't show when I'm excited. I don't show when I'm angry. I find other ways to express these feelings. For example, I journal. So when I'm angry, I will write it down. Sometimes I just listen to music. Sometimes I don't even feel like writing it down. Sometimes I say a prayer. It, it's different ways to kind of cope because at the same time, these feelings, they need an avenue. I need an outlet because if I just stuff them in, I'm not really living. You know, if I'm not showing my happiness, if I'm not expressing how happy I am, I'm not really living. If I'm not expressing how angry or sad I am, it's just, it's part of being human. You need to express these feelings. And so one of the ways that I've been disconnecting myself from my family is by being neutral. I, and I don't like, God is good. I really believe God has been helping me with this one because I'm very neutral at this point. And I don't even know if they've really realized how neutral I am. I don't really show much emotion when I'm with them. It does take, take some time to kind of do it. But I think because for me, I had reached my limit. I had, <clears throat> excuse me, I had really reached my limit with my family. It almost feels like something kind of went off in me. You know, when you get so hurt when you get so fed up, when you get so sick and tired of something that it just feels like something just goes off and you just can no longer take it. You, in as much as maybe prior to that or before, you were not able to do anything about it. But once you get to that point, once you reach your limit, it's like something just completely goes off in you. Or maybe it goes on, you know, maybe it's like a light switch going on. And I think for me, that's what I reached, you know, with this whole situation. I've mentioned this a million times in my episodes that I think me taking antidepressants for the first time in my life, that was my limit. That's when I knew that something has got to change. You know, that's when I knew that what is hurting me so much? Why am I so empty, so anxious? Why do I feel all these feelings? that it even got to a point where I needed to take antidepressants. And I think that was just like my limit. And so I've learned to be neutral. Here's, here's why I don't show these feelings to my family. When I'm happy, I feel like they are not happy that I'm happy. There's a lot of jealousy that goes on. Narcissistic people are very unhappy people. So they don't really want to see you happy. So I don't show when I'm happy. So sometimes when I'm happy, I will just maybe put on my earphones and maybe listen to some good music, you know, that kind of just expresses what I'm currently feeling, you know, so that I I am in the moment of being happy and I teach myself to be happy. Interestingly, the first thing that I said in my counseling session in 2021, when I got to go for counseling for a couple of sessions, the first thing that I said to my counselor was that I feel like I'll never be happy. Like nothing can make me happy. One of the things that a toxic, emotionally abusive family will do is make you feel like nothing is ever good enough. Nothing you do is ever good enough. You are not good enough. And because of that, it influences your happiness. You never quite feel good enough. And so that also that also just limits how happy and expressive you are. Like when something good happens to you or you are proud of yourself, you don't really express it. That was the case with me. Till this day, I remember my graduation day and how I was just not as happy as I should have been. I worked hard for that degree and it was really challenging. You know, I really struggled with that degree. It gave me back pains, literally back pains. There were times when I would go to exams with literally back pains and not because I was staying up all night studying super hard, which I did study hard, but it just always felt like it wasn't good enough because I was a very average student, but I always gave it my best. But the back pains came from anxiety. They were caused by a lot of stress and anxiety, which was not only because of my studies, also because there was an underlying issue which was the fact that I had been emotionally abused 
and I didn't even realize it, that I just had this pressure on me to impress my family, to do well, because I always felt like I was not good enough. And so part of feeling like you're not good enough, it makes it really hard for for you to be truly and genuinely happy, for you to truly celebrate yourself and be like, you know what, I got this degree or I passed that test or, you know, I stood up for myself today. No matter how little it is, it, if you grew up with a very toxic, emotionally abusive, psychologically abusive or narcissistic family, you find it very hard to be proud of yourself, to be happy, to be to celebrate yourself, you know, and even to be celebrated by others. You almost feel like you don't deserve it. You almost feel like maybe people are lying to you. And that was something that I really struggled with. And so now I've realized that I don't want to share my happiness because when I share my happiness with my family, it feels like they they almost put a downer in my happiness. And sometimes it's not really obvious because it's not like when I'm happy, they like, oh, don't bore us. Or they say something, you know, just sometimes it's very subtle and sometimes it's almost like a vibe. I don't even know how to put it. There's no other way. It's just like it's in the air, you know, when you feel happy and you see that it seems like other people are not really happy that you are happy. And so I find other ways to express my happiness because I still need to express my happiness and be proud of myself and, and celebrate myself and do it by myself and not in front of my family and not with my family because with them it's not really genuine, it's not really sincere, they're not really happy for me. But also I don't show them my emotions of sadness or anger because, because when you're sad... You would expect people to be there for you, to support you, you know. But that's not what I would typically get from my family. And that would actually make me more sad, you know. It would make me more sad. I would be sad about one thing, you know, whatever was happening in my life. And then I would find myself, my sadness, I would find my sadness being multiplied by the fact that I felt like my family was not there for me. And when I showed my anger, they always made me feel like I'm being irrational or I'm being way too emotional or way too sensitive. Here's an example. There was a time where I was having challenges with someone at church and this person was frustrating me, right? This person was frustrating me and I would share these things. This was a time where I used to share things with my family because I'm at a point, I'm at a point where I don't, I don't share anything with my family even if it's a joke. That's where, that's how I'm also just disconnecting with my family. There's really little to almost nothing that I share with my family. I don't share, you know, you know, sometimes when you're just having like maybe a conversation with a friend or maybe you're just having a challenge with a friend and you share with your family because you just want to get their input. I don't do that. I don't share a meme, I don't share a joke, I don't share a video I see that I think they would enjoy, I don't share personal details, I don't share what happened to me when I went to the mall, I don't share who I bumped into, legit disconnecting at this point. But when I would be angry and express that, they would make me feel like, I'm being way too emotional. Okay, back to the story where there was someone that I that was challenging me and frustrating me at church, you know, I would tell them that, oh, this person has said this. We were in a team um, for an activity at church and this person was just frustrating me, not really pulling their weight. You know, there was just so much going on. And my family and I, we were all in agreement in terms of like, oh, this guy is being ridiculous, you know, his actions, you know, unreasonable. And then when I would stand up for myself, to this person, you know, because, you know, I would be angry and and then I would tell them and then I would tell my family that this is how I reacted, this is how I responded and they would act like I was way too angry or way too defensive and I I would be not. I, I don't know how to explain this. Part of the emotional abuse is sometimes they make you feel like you are overreacting they make you feel like everything is exaggerated. They will exaggerate something. Like I remember, I'm, I'm having so many thoughts come into my mind, but 
There was this one time that my sister said that my face is oily, right? And she said it, you know, in such a hyperbolic way, like, oh, your face is so oily. And I didn't have a mirror with me. And I think then I got back home, went to the mirror. When I looked at my face, it was oily. It was true. But goodness, oh my, it was not as oily as she made it sound. She made it sound like I was so freaking oily, like just unbelievably oily, overwhelmingly oily. Part of the psychological abuse, part of the emotional abuse, these people want to make you believe what is not true. What she made me believe in that moment, and I, I became self-conscious because I do have oily skin. And, you know, in that particular day, and particular moment, she made it seem like, oh, you are extraordinarily oily. And it was not the case. I got to the mirror, looked at myself, and I'm thinking, why did she make it seem like I was so oily? When I looked at myself, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm oily, but it's nothing shocking. That's part of the emotional abuse, where sometimes facts are exaggerated. Because yes, I was oily, but it wasn't as oily as she made it sound. And so that would be the same thing when I would share with my family about this guy that was frustrating me. And when I told them how I responded, they would make it seem like, oh, you overreacted. And when I look back on that, I'm like, no, I actually didn't over I didn't overreact. I just stood up for myself. And that's another thing with them. They are all talk, but no action. They are very big talk. They act like, yeah, this is what I would do if someone said this to me. And they would make me feel like, oh, yeah, this play, this person is taking advantage of you because you are reserved, yada, yada. But when I stand up for myself, they would turn on me and say like, oh, you shouldn't have said that or you were too harsh or, you know, it sounds mean or rude. But the only reason they would say that is because when push comes to shove, these people are actually cowards. They are, again, I'm not saying that to undermine them or disrespect them. This is factual. Narcissists are very much cowards. It's almost like a bully. Remember that bully from school? They are actually a coward. And so they put on this, you know, this like, look at me, I'm so scary kind of look. But deep down, these people are actually cowards. Because the person who's not a coward is the person who is mature enough you know, and reasonable enough to just calmly deal with the situation instead of just bullying people or bossing people around. So the reason they would say like, oh, you are too harsh or you are, it's because I would reasonably stand up for myself to this guy. And I think for them, because when it really comes down to it, they wouldn't actually stand up for themselves because they are cowards. They are spineless. Again, factual no disrespect. It's not me just name calling them. This is fact. It is a fact. And the sooner you start realizing this as a fact, the better. Because this is not some disrespecting game. I'm not, I'm not just trying here to be like, yeah, I'm just here to badmouth my family. No, I'm speaking factually. Anyway, another way that I've been peacefully disconnecting myself from my family or more like emotionally disconnecting myself from my family, is continually praying that I forgive them. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. Biggest thing. I know sometimes it sounds so cliche, like, oh yeah, when you don't forgive someone, you are just hurting yourself and not the other person. Cliche as it might sound, it's really, really important. If I stick with the unforgiveness for them, they, in a way, they still have a hold on me. And so in as much as I, I cannot say that I've fully forgiven them, because first of all, these people have hurt me all my life. Secondly, these people have not changed. Okay? So I'm not speaking about people who have realized how much they've hurt me and they've asked for forgiveness and they are changing their ways. I'm speaking about people who are still very much hurtful, toxic, abusive, and narcissistic. And so continually, and I thank the Lord because I I feel in my heart, you know, the spirit of forgiveness, you know, just taking hold of me. 
So in as much as I haven't fully forgiven them because sometimes I'm still triggered, sometimes I'm still hurt by the things they say, but I continually pray, I pray, I ask God. Sometimes the simple thing that we lack to do, we kind of think we can just wish forgiveness into our heart or we can just say it and then it just comes to pass. Like I'm asking God, God help me to forgive them, help me. I, there's no way I'm going to do it with my manpower, with my human power. I need God to help me. Another way is that I I am disconnecting from them by not being their source, not being their fuel, not being their supply, not enabling them. How did I enable them? I, I've always said in my episodes that I felt like a mother to my mother. I felt like a counselor, a therapist to my mother. I've always been the mediator between my mother and my sister, both of them being very narcissistic. I I needed to stop being their source. I needed to let them deal with their feelings. I needed to stop playing mother to everyone. I needed to stop holding their hand. I needed to stop trying to make everyone feel good about themselves, making everyone feel better at the cost of my sanity, at the cost of my peace and my joy, at the cost of my self-esteem, I needed to stop that. So one of the ways that I've been disconnecting is by stopping to be their source and their supply. If someone comes to me, if like, say, because this doesn't even happen anymore, that's that's how much progress I've actually made. If my sister would have come to me and, and spoken about my mother, I, I, I tell her, speak to my mother. You know, speak to our mother, go to her. That's one of the ways you kind of cut, uh, you cut yourself from being the source of the supply. So if my sister has a problem with my mother, I will tell her, take it to her. You know, I will gently push her in that direction so that I'm not the mediator. They don't put me in the middle of it. If my mother comes with an issue and talks to me, I will listen, but I am no longer going to be bubbling out with words and advice you know and being a therapist and being a mother to my mother I will listen to her I will calmly listen I will say one or two things so that I get myself out of the situation but my family has been so dependent on me that it it became so exhausting and so burdening to me that I just don't want to be that anymore I also don't talk to my family about each other like what I was mentioning like if my sister came to me I always make it a point now that I don't want to talk about my mother with my sister and I don't want to talk about my sister with my mother or I don't want to talk about anyone else, you know, someone who who will be potentially in my mother's side. I don't want to talk about them to anyone because that is just part of the toxic cycle you know, that sometimes I would find myself in and I'd be caught up in the middle of their drama or, you know, whatever was going on between them. So I've made it a point that I don't talk about them to each other. Also, I do more of what I love. This is an interesting one. In order to disconnect from your toxic family, whether emotionally or physically, do more of what you love. This will help you This will help you to understand yourself better. It will boost your confidence and shut your family's toxicity out. The more you do what you love, the more you understand yourself. The more you do what you love and enjoy. And and this doesn't have to be even hectic stuff. If you love cooking, cook more. If you love singing, sing more. If you love walking, walk more. If you love drawing, draw more. If you love extreme activities, do more of that. Whatever it is, whatever it is, especially if it's like really engaging and productive activities, I would say don't don't even count watching TV or watching videos or watching anything on any screen as part of doing what you love. Because I feel like that's like just downtime kind of activity. Do more of what you love. I have this has majorly helped me. Doing more of what I love. I'm a very creative person. I do more of that. Just listening to the music that I love, discovering new music, journaling, walking, reading. These things have immensely helped me 
to understand myself better, which is very important when you've lived with a very toxic family, a very narcissistic family, because their main thing was to confuse your identity or to make your identity dependent on who they say you are. And who they say you are is not good enough, not worthy, not lovable. And so you need to understand yourself for yourself. And doing more of what you love, cooking, it's, if it's cleaning, I mean, if cleaning is your thing, this will boost your self-esteem. This will boost your confidence, which has been trampled on by your very toxic family.